Good evening, everyone. Welcome to UX and Data. I'm really excited to host this extra event this month, uh, in addition to our regular monthly event. All right, so I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Dale before we move on to his talk. Uh, Dale received a liberal arts degree at Sarah Lawrence College, uh, focusing on literature. But an interest in medicine that then led him to New Mexico to understand mental illness through artificial intelligence. He went on to get a PhD in computer science at Brown University, focusing on scalable machine learning algorithms. His interest in developing tools for investigative journalism then led him to the New York Times as a data scientist, uh, which is where I met Dale first. Uh, we used to work together at the time. <laughs> and driven by the passion to create a better world with AI, um, Dale created AI Dot Reverie. Can you say that right? Oh yeah, yeah sure. Right. Yeah. Which he will now <laughs> tell you more about. So please give Dale a warm welcome. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. I, you know, thank you for being here. Really happy to be here. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. And we'll talk about synthetic data and why I'm so excited about it and why I think it's the future. Okay. So our company is called AI Reverie. Just a little bit of a backstory. Uh, we started in stealth about a year and a half ago. And the real problem we wanted to solve was that if you go to a academic computer vision conference and you sort of scan the papers that you see every, everywhere, you often find that the data sets they're analyzing are like the same data sets like for years and years on end. And so people are building state-of-the-art vision algorithms in the same data set to optimize the you know, perfect golden retriever object detection system. And it's a huge bottleneck, it's a huge problem. And then you'll learn, and I'll talk about more as to why this is a big problem when it comes to training vision algorithms. But we started about stealth about a year and a half ago uh, with my co-founder, Paul. We decided to go ahead and build this uh, as a way to solve this problem of data and computer vision. Okay. So we're a simulation platform. And so what we do is we are trying to simulate data to train uh, computer vision algorithms to understand the world, ultimately more fancier algorithms. Another way you can think of our company is that we are a triple A video game studio that nobody plays our video games. Uh, we just make a lot of really beautiful photorealistic stuff. Um, but uh, that's what we do. We create photorealistic simulations. And why synthetic data? We believe that it's going to be the only way to actually scale the training of vision algorithms in the future. Because especially with the advent of deep learning, uh, some of you might have heard about that, sort of all the rage these days and sort of pushing forward the power of AI. Deep learning algorithms require an enormous amount of data. I mean, we're not talking hundreds of images or even thousands of images. We're talking millions of images. There's a recent paper from Google that showed that even with 300 million images, fed to a deep learning algorithm, it did not stop learning. It did not plateau in terms of its performance. 300 million. And this is a, a system that can really ingest a lot of data. In order to do this, in order to get these images in the real world by hand, it's a really laborious process. And so, um, and I'll talk more about that as to why that is. But we believe synthetic data is going to be the future for things like computer vision. And just to be clear what that is, it's the data that's created in virtual worlds, so rather than collected from the real world. And so there's a lot of ways people think about synthetic data. Uh, some people think about synthetic data in the area of health, of anonymizing health records. So <clears throat> instead of actually giving out real patient data, what they do is to learn statistics around a sort of group of people's health records and sort of provide that instead. But in our case, when we're talking about synthetic data, we're talking about photorealistic simulated images sort of what you would see in a really high-end video game. <laughs> Just to make it super clear, <laughs> left, that's a Google you know, Street View image. And on the right, this is an image we rendered. Uh, in, and this is an actual location in the upper um, east side, the Guggenheim, around that area. As you can sort of a little bit see that part of that architecture. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to create very realistic scenes that are actually in the real world. Okay. And the idea basically is that if we can create it and make it realistic enough, then we can fool a vision algorithm into thinking it's the real thing. I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I'm going to give you a <laughs> five minute, uh, you know, how does modern computer vision work in this one slide, okay? So, so <laughs> bear with me here. 
it starts with images, right? You start getting a lot of real images. They might be real. You might have taken them with a camera, or they're synthetic. They're coming from a video game world that we've sort of maybe designed. The key part to remember is that once you get these images, you can't just feed them to a vision algorithm. What you have to do is you have to get uh, people to actually annotate these images. And what, that, what ends up happening, is, for example, one of the simplest types of annotations that people would do is to put boxes around the objects you want to detect. So let's say you want to sort of detect a golden retriever. You want to detect a car. What people will do is they'll take every image. And there's entire companies and startups that have devoted their entire business model around connecting people to images to do this very laborious task of putting boxes around objects. So after you, let's say, you know, label and annotate like 100,000 of, of these images, a vision algorithm will then sort of look at all of these images, look at where you put, put the boxes around those things, and learn a kind of generalization around that area of what a dog might be after all of these examples. And the idea is that when you then give it a new image that it's never seen before, the deep learning algorithm here has learned a way to generalize across all possible dogs at every possible lighting condition, at every possible angle, and then can say that that's a dog. Okay? Now, I talked about a simple annotation of 2D bounding boxes. These things get even more sophisticated. So when you want, let's say, an algorithm to be able to detect the outlines of an object, to give you a perfect edge boundary sort of outline of where an object is, uh, you, then you have to sort of give it annotations that represent that. So kind of like a coloring book. You have an image, and you have to exactly color the exact area of where that object is. That, you can imagine, takes more time, right? Now imagine video. <laughs> you want to start uh, you know, understanding video and how to detect things in video. You can just, that problem just starts scaling and becomes, oh, there you go. Uh, it just starts getting more and more complicated, right? But that is how modern computer vision works, and this is, what, this is the pipeline of how you train a very sophisticated vision algorithm capable of doing all sorts of the amazing things that we see in, in sort of the news these days. Okay. So once you train it, you spend a lot of money collecting that data, you spend a lot of money annotating it, right? So for example, you know, uh, self-driving car companies will hire thousands of people, thousands of people full-time to just label data. Right, for, for their sort of vision algorithms. Once you spend all that money doing that, you then train it and then you put it on a device, let's say a camera, it can be a, a, you know, any kind of system that is capable of running the algorithm, uh, edge devices like the AWS Deep Lens that came out recently, or just any camera on a car, something like that. Right? So this is sort of an end-to-end -end kind of idea of how you start from images and all the way get to a vision algorithm that works in practice. And what we're trying to say is that because we create the data and we understand and we can actually generate it from the ground up, we have actually full access to this whole pipeline. Because it turns out that algorithms now are a dime a dozen. You can find them on GitHub and you can download them and get them anywhere. Training them, the hardware, GPUs, you can go on Amazon and train it all. But the hard part has always been data. That's always been the bottleneck. And that's what we're trying to solve with synthetic data. So if you're not convinced of the value of synthetic data, then everything else that I'm going to talk about doesn't really work. So I'm going to spend some time trying to convince you why synthetic data is super important. Okay? And there's four major themes I want to talk about. The first one is how do you scale the number of objects that your algorithm can classify and understand? So let's say you just want to create a dog detector. That's great. You spend your time building and tagging all these images to detect dogs. But now you want to detect between 20 or 30 different breeds of dogs. right? You then have to find all of those images with those dogs, and you also have to annotate that as well. Um, unconventional perspectives. So if you have a camera that a lot of images that you find online are taken by people, and so there's biases there, right? And they're taken during the day often in certain locations. But let's say you have a camera now on the floor, right? And it has to work on the floor, and all of a sudden that perspective skews all the images. And you can't use normal images anymore to then be able to feed to the vision algorithm because then it's sort of going to bias it in the wrong ways. Right? Access to hard places. You know, there are places in the world where cameras don't like to be or people don't like to be taking images of. So, you know, Antarctica with one place, uh, conflict zones, another place. I'll talk more about that later, but it's, there are certain places where just cameras and image acquisition is just a difficult process. And of course, one of the big reasons that self-driving car companies are also getting to this business of simulation is of these rare scenarios and outlier events. It is hard to literally find 
you know, uh, for a car to see accidents, right? It's hard to get data around things like major traffic accidents. But when you're training a vision algorithm to be able to detect when an accident happens, you cannot take any chances, right? You do not want a self-driving car that does not know how to detect when there is an accident in front of you. So this is one of the major reasons also why simulation has become so popular. Um, scalable object detection, I like to sort of use this to really bring home the point. Uh, let's say you have, you have to create a blue whale detector, right? So blue whales are very hard to find in nature. They don't like to hang, they might not hang around while you're trying to take pictures of them. Uh, and so in those instances, maybe it might just be easier to have a 3D model that actually represents that and then pre-train your algorithm that way. You might also have situations where you need to be able to detect brands uh, as they come and new brands are created. And so Amazon Go or any kind of retail market right, will want to be able to detect new brands that come out. And in that case, you don't want to always have to be taking images of that. Uh, there's also things with missing people. So let's say you lost your child and you are really, really have no idea where your child is. And one thing you can do is you can actually maybe render your child's face, teach a vision algorithm what, what that child looks like, and then be able to then train it to then detect it in, in, you know, from a surveillance camera in the mall somewhere. So being able to do that with synthetic data is a lot easier than just trying to collect real images and being able to then um, train it that way. Again, these are just examples of some unconventional perspectives. Uh, you have this sort of household robot. This is a perspective from, let's say, a, a vacuum, robot vacuum. Um, of course, you also have different perspectives from surveillance and traffic cameras at traffic intersections or even from a drone when you're flying all the way up from there. And so we've done our own sort of tests and found that some of the most popular data sets that you would train a vision algorithm, state of the art, best you know, segmentation object detection algorithm in the latest paper that came out. And it works great when you sort of are like on the ground looking at images of cars and things like that moving. But the moment you try to take a drone perspective, uh, it starts thinking it's, it's a cell phone or a suitcase. <laughs> so it's literally that because it's been fed so many images of cars on the ground and these data sets only contain those images um, that it's really hard to uh, have it generalized. And we also, with, when we talk to clients, we found so many cases where they're, they just can't collect images easily in certain places. So, so like I said before, like the Arctic, you know, it's not easy to travel there. It's not easy to collect images. If you have to detect things or you have to use vision there, that's a problem. Underwater as well, certain types of, you know, underwater environments are really crucial to model. Uh, so, so being able to do that is a lot easier in simulation. And of course, personal homes. Um, so any, any, in the future of a smart home is gonna require data around interiors. But most people, this is a data privacy issue. Most people do not want companies collecting images of you know, them inside their personal homes. So a lot of these companies have to think about simulation as a way to solve their vision problems. And of course, these rare scenarios. So if you have humanitarian disasters like floods, um, that doesn't happen very often. And you might need to have a vision algorithm work in a situation to rescue people who are drowning from a flood. Or there might be very sort of rare moments where you have damage to like a, a wind turbine and then you have to be able to sort of capture that as soon as possible because we all know from like a little crack on your window glass and your car glass, that thing spreads. <laughs> and that can be real damage there if you can't detect it. And of course, traffic accidents, huge, huge problem there. Um, being able to detect that is, uh, you don't want a self-driving car working 96% of the time. You kind of want it working 99.9% .9 of the time. And getting, and the big problem has always been getting to that last two, 3%. You know? So what did we do? Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to create a platform around this. Basically, how do we create synthetic data that can service a lot of different scenarios? Uh, and this is what I'm going to sort of talk about next. When we started thinking about how to make synthetic data work, uh, there are three major challenges. Right? And we sort of break it down into these three things. The first is realism. And by realism, I'm not just saying that the image has to be real. I'm talking about realism in the context of computer graphics. So it turns out um, in order to make a scene photorealistic, it, it has a lot to do with light. And the light is the most important factor in terms of making a photorealistic graphic. 
uh, up here. If, if, and what you, what you end up doing in game engines and things of that nature is that you're literally calculating the way light rays bounce off of things from a light source. And you're actually modeling that mathematically. And, and so that's really important. The ability to model that and do that effectively is what gives realism to the scenes uh, that we need. Diversity. Uh, of course, the image above there, that's not what we render. That's just an example <laughs> of what you don't want, right? There's nothing there, right? So it's, it's actually not a trivial problem to create scenes of enough diversity in which you can fool a vision algorithm into making uh, into thinking that it can generalize to the real world. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we create complex, diverse scenes driven through algorithms and learning from data and then using that as a way to then sort of process how to place things. So the simple problem is actually a really hard one of just how to place everything in a room or in a scene or in an environment. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about that. And the final part is scale. How do we create large worlds? And how do we create them with, you know, rep you know with with the kind of uh, scale that we need in order to really generalize across all sorts of different areas. Um, and so we'll talk more about that, but if we, if we think about the challenge of synthetic data, those are the three uh, pillars in which we want to sort of uh, work on. So these are just some scenes and images that we've rendered. Um, again, the point that I want to sort of bring across here is that we have a system that is trying to be able to create a lot of different kinds of scenes. So some companies are focused only on streets. Some companies are, you know, for self-driving cars, they only sort of focus on modeling urban street scenes. But for us, we were thinking about what does it take to create a technology that can render all sorts of different types of scenes. So that's sort of the point. And these are, you know, interiors, for example, inside homes, uh, farm areas, rural areas, refineries, factories. Uh, warehouses, all sorts of these kinds of scenes. And you, we'll show you a nice little demo reel at the end uh, that shows a little bit more of that. And how do we do it? What we do is, and this is a lot of the time we spent in stealth working on this, is that the biggest cost to synthetic worlds, uh, if, you, if you guys have heard of um, Grand Theft Auto, uh, the video game, GTA V, the budget for that to create the world, they estimated creating just the world, not the gameplay, just creating that world, was upwards of $100 million. It's a massive, beautiful world. But the number of technical artists and the people that they had to use, enormous costs. So if you were to, able to create that world with a fraction of the price, how do you do it? The way we do it and the way we approach it is to say, let's take all this geospatial data. Uh, we have really rich, beautiful, high resolution geospatial data. Combine it all inside the game engine and be able to automatically generate those areas. So the, the, literally the way we create our worlds is we pick a GPS coordinate and then we decide how big from that point we want to create that virtual world and then we then generate it. And we do that by using a combination of things like height data that we get, um, uh, satellite images, land cover maps telling us where things are foliage, where things are buildings, um, open street maps, all of that. So we spent a lot of time aggregating all of that data so that we can then put it and push it through a very powerful game engine. The game engine we're using is called Unreal. And we then use that to then generate these rich worlds. It sh uh, shaves off 80, 90% of the time that technical artists would then have to do to create that world right off the bat. To go further into this, we build these virtual worlds, so that's one part of that process that's procedural. But the other parts I want to highlight is that we spent a lot of time just collecting 3D models and meshes across the internet. So I am now an addicted window shopper to 3D models, so I can't stop but like you know freeze and buy all the 3D models I would like. We spent a lot of time building a beautiful collection of these 3D models, and what we've done also is that we've We've done things like being able to swap the materials on our models. So for it, a leather couch can now be a fabric couch. And it does that dynamically to create more diversity. Um, and so this is a whole system that we built. And of course, the final part is the annotations. You want to be able to take a picture in this virtual world. If you're playing through it and you're walking through it, you take a picture and be able to get the annotations for any type of computer vision algorithm you need and then be able to directly feed it into it. So, by doing all of these three things, we have built essentially a platform that allows us to then create a world, fill it with a lot of beautiful, complex scenes, take pictures of it, and then directly feed it into a vision algorithm. 
These are just some more examples that you've seen. Um, some bare earth terrain, some interiors, some urban scenes. Talking about diverse objects, that's a little picture of uh, uh, Botswana, Africa on the upper right. Um, on the lower right is an area in Japan uh, where we're interested in working with construction companies to help them identify those things. And of course on the left are uh, some street urban scenes. These are just some examples of annotations. Uh, so, for example, on the upper left, you have these 2D bounding boxes. This is generated in real time. So we can just, we're, we have a camera that's flying above that scene while cars are moving. We just take a picture, and all those boxes are already there. And then we can directly feed it into an object detection algorithm, which needs those kinds of annotations in order for it to train. Um, on the upper right here, you, found, you find uh, 3D bounding boxes. Those annotations are interesting. They're harder. Right? You can just imagine that a human having to go in and put 3D boxes around things in a 2D image. But what do you get from that? What you get is that the algorithm can now understand pose and orientation of an object. So in the 2D bounding boxes, all you can sort of do is localize. The algorithm will only be able to tell you to localize. In the 3D bounding box, you suddenly have the ability to now understand the pose and orientation of an object, which is very powerful for th problems like uh, robotic arm grasping. If you don't know the pose or the orientation of an object, you can actually really screw up the ability to grasp something. Lower right are semantic uh, instance segmentations, another type of vision algorithm. Uh, for that, there might be instances where you really need to know the outlines of something. So let's say you're trying to create a robot that can pick up weeds and be able to sort of, you know, be able to ex extract and grasp something. If just the bounding box isn't going to really be good enough. You have to know the outline of the plant itself. And so imagine trying to annotate that in the real world. Not trivial, right? If you take a step back and think about what these annotations represent at a high level, the annotations are essentially our attempt, a, a reflection of the sophistication of the algorithm. The fancier the annotation, the, the, the more what you encode in the annotation of how you want to do it is in some ways what the vision algorithm wants to learn, right? So like the 3D bounding boxes, as an annotation represents what you want to learn about the world. Right? And so thinking from that angle, simulation becomes such an important part because what we want to learn, what we understand about the world, we can encode directly into it and then get back what we can then use in the real world. So here is a little demo um, that we can just show right here. Let me just full screen this. It's a little quick little thing. So dynamic lighting, this is an area of Botswana, Africa. Elephant conservation, I'm happy to talk about some of the problems we're working on. Uh, wildlife conservation is a big problem. Turns out the biggest problem of wildlife conservation is counting. Yeah, if you can't count, then you really don't know how many animals are remaining. <laughs> so, and it's not a, a cheap problem either. These are different types of annotation modes. We just, this is real time, we're able to sort of do this right off the bat. Surface normals tells you geometry of an object. You can do infrared modes. Um, we talked about ways of automatically, dynamically changing environments. This is stuff that we can do in real time. See these 2D bounding boxes? Agriculture is a really big one, too, in terms of noxious weed detection, being able to detect um, weeds. Because right now, the way we sort of apply that is uh, ad hoc herbicides across all crops. Interiors for the smart homes, this is dynamically changing. Um, great. So that is just a little snippet of what we sort of generate and the kinds of worlds we create. And um, just get out of this. OK, let me see. Great. And here's another example of where we are um, tracking elephants. So we talked a little bit about wildlife conservation here. Uh, one of the things we did was as a test, we took one of the latest state-of-the-art algorithms um, 
YOLO. It stands for you only look once. It's a really fast object detection algorithm. And we took uh, it sort of pre-trained. So they published the paper, they trained the algorithm, and they said, here, you can download this algorithm and actually apply it. And then there's a really popular data set called Microsoft Coco. It like, contains a whole bunch of object categories you can use to train vision algorithms, one of them being elephants. And so because you know, I was particularly interested in this problem of, of, of being able to create a vision algorithm that can track elephants, I was like, great, let's see how well it does. And it turns out uh, we took a video from YouTube of somebody who created this beautiful drone video of overlooking elephants as, it sort of, as a herd is just sort of walking around. And when we applied it, uh, it was terrible. The performance was awful. It thought everything was a cow or a sheep. And we're like, whoa, did we do something wrong? Like, what, what did we do? Like, what's going on? So we retrained it again, changed the hyperparameters, changed this, changed that, tweaked, you know. And with all this stuff, it kind of can be kind of a black art training a deep learning algorithm. So we tried it, and then like at some point, I'm, I'm just like sort of looking at the images themselves, and I realized that all of the images were just like tourists taking pictures of elephants that they were riding. And it's like all of these were images on the ground of elephants, just sort of like, and a lot of great elephant pictures, but not barely were there any from an aerial perspective. And so what we did was, okay, well, why don't we synthetically simulate that perspective, those elephants, in that, you know, in sort of similar to that drone video that you saw in that little clip. And then when we trained it on that, the object detection algorithm was significantly better. And I'll just show you a quick clip of what that looks like a side-by-side -side comparison. So on the left is the YOLO algorithm, on the right is the uh, algorithm after we gave it our data. And so it's hard to see, but the red boxes represent elephants there. And you can see that localization, everything in the left, cow, sheep, right? Those are the kinds of images that MS Coco on the, on the bottom there, you see? That's the kinds of images that you train it with. Herds of cows. Um, And those are the kinds of images that you typically see in the data set that people have spent a lot of time annotating. And this is the same data set everyone uses in computer vision and things like that. But so yeah, and generally this is a problem of data. This is a problem of not having the right data to be able to train it in the kind of situation that this algorithm needs to work in. And the process, going back, it's a really laborious process. It prevents people from being able to create the applications they need in order to solve the important problems because the capital cost of creating this data is so enormous that there's some huge issues there. So, Yeah, so it works pretty well. Occasionally it'll get like, you'll think an elephant is a person, but these algorithms aren't perfect, but they're getting better. They're definitely getting better. And, uh, and you know, what we want to do is we want to sort of be able to create all this data so that we can not have to worry about the bottleneck of training vision algorithms in the future. It really is a sort of unfortunate bottleneck that that's how you have to do it. But until we can create pure general human AI, we're going to be stuck with this process of trying to use um, deep learning and these kinds of image data sets. So just try it. So yeah, this is the talk. Fake it with synthetic data, and you can make it in the real world. Thanks to Anne, that's really great. I like that slogan. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is what we do. And uh, oh, here are some other use cases. We can show a little clip of the uh, construction um, that we're sort of working on. Um, and some, there's some cool wind turbines in the back. So people are also interested in understanding uh, how to fix wind turbines if there's structural damage there. Uh, how do you identify, locate that? Um, I like how you can just do it right in the stack. Great. So I think at this point, um, yeah, I mean, at this point, we're just sort of like, you know, this is sort of what we have. And uh, at this point, we're happy to take questions. Or is that right, Kim? Is that, yeah. is if that you have a questions, wait for the mic. Uh, <coughs> Oh yeah. Make them invisible. So yeah, yeah, that's a great yeah, question. How, how do you? Yeah. 
Um, that's, that's hard, right? That's the hard problem. There's biases in synthetic data. I would argue that there's also biases in real images. And I think the beautiful process is the one where you create synthetic data, you test it out in the real world, see where it fails, and then you then create the synthetic part that where it failed at. So in your example of certain, you know, fat people, like you said, you might then start creating people who look like that as part of your synthetic data set. And that's how our process works. Um, and so it's not going to be perfect the first time, of course. And this works a lot better when the environments are more constrained, right? Uh, so you can imagine because there's less diversity in what you have to model. But once you get that right and you go through this whole cycle and this process, it's just so much more efficient. You just, you're just able to, you know, it's a lot easier for me to hang out in my apartment in Brooklyn and virtually fly a drone in Africa than it is for me to fly to Tanzania and then try to fly a drone there to take images. So it's sort of this is the sort of, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, so I was wondering when you guys generate these virtual worlds um, and you guys are doing you know, object recognition, are you then beholden to all the flaws that are involved there? Then how do you basically make sure that those problems of you know, bias and what you're seeing aren't actually then flowing into your synthetic data? That question makes sense. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of techniques you can use to mitigate for that, right? Because of course, like if synthetic was, um, well, would you agree with me though that if we get it to, as good as real real data, then you get all the benefits of synthetic data, yes. right? Beautiful okay. stuff, right? Um, so the the ways to mitigate people spend a lot of time doing research in that area, and so people have uh, worked on really interesting ways of combining the two. So it turns out if you combine real data and synthetic data while you're training the algorithm, it works wonderfully. And so some of the sort of noise in the real world gets transferred to synthetic and the same thing, you get the benefits of the scalability of synthetic data and diversity there. So it's kind of like mixing and hodgepodge. There's other advanced techniques like domain adaptation. Those are techniques where you use an algorithm to actually try to do image style transfer. If you've seen some of these cool examples of Van Gogh stylized images, you can imagine the same kind of process where you take real images and try to do that to synthetic images. Right, try to make them more realistic, and then you then use that to train the vision algorithm. So there's a there's a rich sort of literature around that as well. Yeah, a question about the, for the annotations. Um, were the images that you're showing us are these just kind of conveying what the annotations are conveying, but then you're actually delivering the annotation to the models in some kind of side channel or is it are they actually reading it from the, the oh. images? Yeah, so the annotations like a lot of that metadata is stored in some file like a JSON or an XML file that gets read in with the image itself. So oftentimes for something like a 2D bounding box, you actually give it the raw image. And then you give it the raw image with the JSON file telling you where the bound boxes are. And the algorithm will then know how to go into that particular area of the image, extract those pixels, and learn from that. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think it's very interesting. And forgive me, are you attaching to any of this either more complex data about, for example, not simply uh, what things look like, but actually how they behave with more complex um, kind of uh, behavioral algorithms? And also, I wonder whether accurate that will even for example, to attach behavior to a certain kind of image. So, for example, if you know, um, I don't know, lion in X proximity to person X happens, and you know, a lion eats human. Right. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Um, so you're talking about complex behaviors. How do you yeah, account for that? Yeah. yeah, and that's a great question. Um, you know, there is a rich sort of uh, ecosystem of animation and 3D models that are animated, like those elephants you saw moving around and walking around there. And it's a hard problem. It's not, you know, to get more and more complex animations. Uh, I look at that as a matter, there's multiple ways of going about it, but the, the easiest way is to collect a lot of these animations and incorporate the 3D models that have all of that. And so they're actually walking around, being simulated, doing things, doing interesting things. So we do have a large library there. Um, in the future, I think those animations, what, what I'm seeing is they're going to be driven themselves by deep learning. And they themselves, you then learn how to actually create all these new blendable animations that can do interesting 
interpolate between all sorts of different types of animations to create even fancier ones. But for problems in which animation is crucial, uh, such as video activity, you kind of have to get that right. And so that's an area that, that you know, we are working on and focusing on. But you do have to think about that carefully. Yeah. At this stage, is that stuff, if you're not interested in sort of photorealism, is that stuff kind of already available, for example, if it were in 2D kind of form, um, the, the kind of attachment of, of behavior to certain kinds of forms? Um, if you're not interested in realism, photorealism? Right, if it doesn't need to be 3D. Oh, if it doesn't need to be 3D? I don't know. I mean, you can render things in 2D if you want. But the way we do it is we just try to create a video game almost that is as realistic as possible with the idea that the 2D images we take will be able to then sort of, you know, absorb all that and, and you know, there's enough complexity in the behavior itself that you get, uh, you can generalize to the real world. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering how you deal with messiness. Like a lot of the um, homes you've shown are, are very clean and yeah, you yeah. don't have socks strewn about. Or right, I just, I, I just didn't want to reflect my real life on the demo, <laughs> that's all. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean messiness is a very, it's a question of complexity and diversity, right? And so we actually have like clutter algorithms where we will randomly place clutter in things because that's actually what the real world looks like, right? So um, this is like a nice sort of pretty rendition of it, but when you look at the actual images, I mean, we're generating thousands of rooms, extracting hundreds of thousands of images. You can't all have them look pretty and beautiful like that. So you're right, I mean, we do have to think carefully about how to create that kind of interesting sort of realism and clutter and things like that. But this is, that gets sort of into the weeds, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the way I think about bias is really more about um, bias becomes a problem if you're if you're trying to create an algorithm that's very general, right? Because the, the question of bias is about way too much data of one kind. Like in the example with the elephant demo, right? The Microsoft Cocoa data set itself, a real data set, is biased towards elephants on the ground, right? So I think of bias as literally what the focus of the data was on. So if the focus of the data was on detecting uh, car accidents, right? Uh, you do have to create a lot of different kinds of accidents. You have to create a lot of various accidents that, you know, using, you know, modeling the physics of things. Cars crashing in very different locations. But I would argue, and the reason why Google and all of these other companies are using simulation, is because it's a lot easier to do that in a simulator than it is to get real cars and crash them into each other. So the, the, the ability to actually overcome bias, I would argue, is much better in a simulator than it would be in the real world, uh, just because of the enormous costs you would take, you would have to accrue in order to create all of those different scenarios. Uh, on average, and Nvidia estimated that you would have to drive a fleet of autonomous cars, 20 autonomous cars, um, something upwards of like, uh, uh, what was it like, some ridiculous number, a million, a million miles in order to get into 700 accidents, something like that. So it's just a lot of miles you have to drive. That's really. Um, no, that's wrong. It's a billion miles. Yeah, it's a billion miles. You'd have to drive a billion miles uh, to in order to get into like 700 or 800 accidents. That's what they estimate. So, are you going to then take each autonomous car and drive it for that long? Keep in mind, a Prius that's autonomous is about the cost of a Ferrari. It's about $350,000 to outfit a Prius with self-driving capabilities. Get 20 of those? Not cheap. So, a simulator is a lot easier in order to sort of account for that, I would argue, yeah. Early on, you mentioned that some of the modern uh, 
deep learning algorithms can soak up hundreds of millions of training images before yeah. becoming saturated. Um, it might be tough to extract like a general rule for this, but have you found, like, do you reach a plateau using your synthetic data? Oh, that's a, that's a question of also the algorithm. What is the algorithm capable? I mean, one of the, the reasons why deep learning has become so powerful, I mean, these ideas of deep learning algorithms have been around since the 60s and 70s, and it only took off in the last five or six years because what they found was that they can ingest a lot of data. What you found before deep learning was that it would actually plateau quite quickly. A lot of computer vision algorithms, the more data you fed it, it still didn't get better, right? So <coughs> understanding that, it really then depends on what the deep learning algorithm is capable of doing. But because we've had this data, data bottleneck, we haven't been really able to see the limits of it. Um, and for our own experience, we found that we, you, know, you could train, uh, depending on the type of data you give it, you can give it millions and millions of images. It'll still keep learning things. Uh, but again, it's a, a question of the algorithm itself, how, how, how complex it is. If it's a simple algorithm, it might not be able to ingest as much data. So you have to take that into account. And you also have to take into account what you're trying to do with the algorithm itself. You know? So if you're just trying to create a dog detector, you might not need to give it 100 million images of dogs. Right? But if you're trying to understand the space of all possible accidents in the world, you know, it might be a much more uh, bigger data kind of need there. Hi. Um, uh, so I was wondering if, if this uh, data can be applied to perhaps things that you, we haven't seen or haven't mentioned, like uh, pollution, plastic pollution in the water, or mm -hmm. medical, uh, things in the medical field, like navigating yeah. the human body, or um, we, uh, space ex exploration. So I was just wondering if, if that's possible to kind of delve into those fields. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say a way of thinking about it is if you were to have an eyeball look at something and you can extract interesting things from looking at an image as a human being, then there might be something you can do there in vision. To be specific about uh, areas of health and pollution, definitely. I mean, pollution, being able to detect bottles and trash in the water, very doable if you can sort of create that data, right? And it has to be able to detect it. For health, uh, one of the things we've been looking at her, uh, it turns out that the biggest cause for hospital-based infections is hand washing. Just literally, people don't wash their hands. And so what hospitals have been doing is that they've been actually using cameras to monitor uh, anonymously it, how much of the hand sanitizer people have been using. And right now, that process is manual. They literally have a person sample videos whenever a, a motion camera has been sort of activated to see if a person actually sanitize their hands, and they do this kind of group guilt thing, where they're like, 80% of our doctors just passed us, and you know, they didn't do anything. Uh, but you can imagine how computer vision can be like, okay, we've detected this, we've counted this, we can create a statistic around it, and that's at the end of the day very powerful, because then you can inform uh, the people who work at the hospital how poorly they're, uh, <laughs> they're killing people, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> with their, with their uh, inability to wash their hands. And it turns out that's, that's, the one of, that's the biggest cause for hospital-based infections. Yeah. So I have a question about um, what do you see people using um, when deciding between storing like a static data set versus just running the generator forever? And did, is it, like what kind of work did you do to um, minimize the number of images, but then get the most diverse, so sort of like getting different angles each time and, and not outputting something that looks the same? Yeah, I mean, from that perspective, I mean, so the way we think about this is what is the, how in the real world is the vision algorithm going to work? So let's say we take the self-driving car example. We literally would simulate a car in that world and have that incorporate and ingest images that way. And so depending on how, it, like we first, when we work with a customer, we first figure out is it gonna be, is it the camera attached to a traffic cam at an intersection? And at that point, your angle is fixed, right? And all we have to do is simulate that particular traffic intersection and sort of see there. But if it's a moving thing, we have to simulate that. So we actually literally simulate where the camera is gonna move and go, right, in that virtual world. And because we can create these worlds at scale, they can move a lot. 
And that's how we create that kind of diversity. Uh, but yeah, self-driving car is an example in which you keep um, there, not only do you need computer vision, but you also need to teach it how to drive, right? You actually need to teach it how to move. And so there's another algorithm responsible for actually ingesting images continuously, right? And learning how to, sort of like Pavlovian conditioning, that's called reinforcement learning. You crash, it gets a, a negative reward. It gets, goes a certain distance, it gets a positive reward. So there's another layer there where it learns how to drive autonomously through that process of continuously ingesting images and, and understanding when it sort of hits the curb or things like that too. That's just an example of, of that kind of uh, concept there. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Dale. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Time. All right, thank you all for listening. Um, Great. All right. uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, if you heard of uh, our spin-off, Data and the Greater Good, we will have an event for that on July 23rd. Matt, do you want to say a little bit about it? Sure. So we'll have the, uh, we'll have the Chief Communications Officer from Lincoln Center. We'll have a head of analytics from the Whitney uh, coming to speak, and we'll be at our normal location. And those tickets are available right now. And that's a workbench. And uh, the day after that, on July 24th, uh, UX and data will also be at workbench. And we'll have Sagar Mohi talking about visualizing data for user interfaces and sci-fi games. So um, you can go on and sign up for those now. Uh, thank you to Anne for helping to arrange this event. And thank you all for coming. And we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks or the next event. Thank you.